Hi, I'm Jean Schumacher, and I am founder of Simply Plant Based, where I've got a lot of programs and resources to help you transition and change your life and change your health destiny. And tonight, I am with Dr. Neil Barnard, who is the founder of the Barnard Medical Center, the president of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, and author of some amazing books. And tonight, we're going to be discussing his newest book called Your Body in Balance, and we're on part two. So thank you so much, Dr. Barnard, for being here tonight. Well, thank you, Jean. It's great to be with you again. Well, we've got a lot. We're diving into women's health issues. We're going diving in deep tonight. We're, first up, we're going to start talking about tackling hormonal cancer mm -hmm. for women, which would be the breast, uterine, and ovarian. So let's just start with the basics. What is cancer? Well, cancer means that the DNA in the cell is changing. The DNA is the blueprint that makes you what you are. And if that stays in its normal configuration, everything's fine. But in cancer, something is, is damaging that DNA. It's taking a, a little bit out of it or, or changing it in some way. And that causes the cell to no longer be able to just stay still. It starts multiplying. One becomes two, two become four, four become eight. And then pieces can break off and spread elsewhere in the body. And that's cancer. Well, for women, we keep coming back to estrogen. What impact does high amounts of estrogen have on the female body in, in regards to cancer? Estrogen is a double-edged sword. This is the, uh, the female sex hormone. There's women have it, uh, men even have traces of it. And in normal amounts, everything is fine. However, estrogen can be pretty sneaky. It can pass through, say, a breast cell's membrane going into the breast cell. It can then even actually penetrate the nucleus of that cell. And once it's inside the nucleus, it can damage DNA. So am I saying that your own estrogen can give you cancer? Yes, that is what I'm saying. And now, th now that's unsurprising. How could your own hormones give you cancer? But, but all of our hormones are essential and beneficial, but also very dangerous. Thyroid hormone, if you have too much of it, it can cause uh, tremendous problems. Growth hormone, totally normal thing, but if you have too much of it, it can be a problem. Insulin is an important hormone. If you've got too much, it can kill you. So with estrogens, exactly the same story. Wow, okay. You need, you need to be in balance. <laughs> like your body in balance? That's oh. it, that's, <laughs> that's, like that. that is where that title came from. Well, Japan has had, you know, one of the lowest rates of breast cancer, but between 1975 and 2000, the rate of breast cancer doubled. What's going on there? This was westernization. But before there was a McDonald's in Tokyo, uh, I have to tell you that the diet was predominantly a rice-based diet. There might have been some meat, some fish, but it was little amounts that were really there to flavor the rice or the noodles and very lots of vegetables. This was not ice cream you know, and, and cheese territory either. Dairy products were, were not the thing. But westernization proceeded both with fast food restaurants and business lunches, uh, steakhouses became a thing. And what happened was that breast cancer rates started to go up along with diabetes and many other things. However, women who did not westernize their diets were not at higher risk of developing cancer. It was the women who westernized where the breast cancer came in. So the sad diet. Yeah, yeah, the, the standard American diet, unfortunately, became more and more a standard Japanese diet. And, and, and by the way, it's not just Japan. You see this in China, you see, you see this in many other countries. Westernization is, is really proceeding apace, and that's really an unfortunate problem. Well, actually, that reminds me, we had a question that came from one of the viewers from the first video, and they said, regarding cheese, you know, like if anybody goes to countries like in Europe, like France, Holland, Germany, they consume so much cheese, but do they have problems with fertility? It's an interesting thing. Researchers have found that countries that eat the least dairy products have the most fertility, and, and not, not just the most fertility, but the more, the more persistent fertility. In the United States, women are, by and large, fairly fertile in their 20s, but by 28, 29, 30, and then through the 30s, you see it start to, to fall off. That's what goes along with dairy consumption. Now, in Europe, I have to say, Europe is changing too. The westernization, so to speak, occurred earlier. 
But there was a time where if you would go to France, there was not a French diet. In the north and east, it was lots of dairy, but in the south, the whole Mediterranean region, the chefs would, they would scoff at the idea of cooking with cream and putting cheese all over everything. It was a culture of olive oil. Similarly with, with Italy, uh, Spain, same kind of story. But now you're seeing much more mixing of these, unfortunately. Okay. Well, three things you recommend to help prevent cancer, cut the fat, dump the dairy, boost the fiber. Let, let's start with the fat. Share with what was found in the Women's Intervention Nutrition Study. Right. The WIN study, Women's Intervention Nutrition Study, it was all women who had breast cancer, more than 2,000 of them. And the researchers brought them in and asked half of the group to do something rather simple, cut the fat uh, in their diet. It wasn't a vegetarian or vegan diet, but it was much lower in fat. And by and large, the women did this. And as time went on, year after year, the researchers looked at who remained healthy. And it turned out the women who really did cut the fat were about 24% less likely to have their cancer return. So that's good. If you get that benefit from just a modest or moderate reduction in fat, what if you throw out the animal fats altogether? Could you do better? Very likely. So anyway, the WIND study was, was a real classic example of the fact that cutting the fat really does help. Okay. Well, researchers with the Women's Health Initiative drew blood samples from about 267 postmenopausal women. What did they find? Yeah. In this case, they, they looked at the amount of body fat that women had, and then they looked in their blood to see how much estrogen was circulating. And what you discovered is that when women had more body fat, they had more estrogen circulating in their blood. So what that really means is if I'm carrying extra body fat, then I have more estrogen that can stimulate not only the likelihood that cancer could start, but also the growth of a cancer that's already there. It's another good reason for trimming away extra and unwanted weight. Well, there was a study done in Shanghai that followed a large group of women with breast cancer. What were the results there? Yeah, this was, I, th I think, a really important study because we tend to think of weight changes mattering only if it's a dramatic weight change. I weigh 300 pounds and now I'm down to 150, and isn't that great? What they found in Shanghai is that even within what we would consider a normal body mass index, your, your cancer risk would would change. So if you picked the, the thinnest women, they had the, the greatest cancer survival, but women who were even marginally heavier, still within the, the healthy BMI range, had uh, reduced cancer survival. So bottom line, you don't want to be overly thin, but, you, but for women to, who have cancer already, the more that you're able to get to a healthy weight, the better off you are. Now, by the way, let's say a woman is, is overweight, and she's got her diagnosis of cancer, and she'll think, oh, my die is cast. Not necessarily. Even weight loss after diagnosis does matter, and it matters a lot. Wow. In, in a helpful way. Wow. Great. Yeah. That is a good thing. Yeah. Well, on to ditching the dairy. What shared the results of the California study of women diagnosed with breast cancer? Yeah, this was a, a very troubling study. What... First of all, dairy products are a mixture. There's some good things in dairy products. There's a little bit of vitamin D, there's some calcium, that, that's all good. But then there's, there's a lot of fat in it. It's mostly bad fat and there are traces of estrogens in it. So pus. let's not forget the pus. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'm sure you're cheering everybody up with, with that now. But researchers, in, in this case, in, in this particular California study, they brought in a large group of women. They'd all been diagnosed with breast cancer. And what they looked at was their high-fat dairy consumption. That's butter and cheese and that kind of thing. And what they found was very worrisome. Those women who consumed more of the high-fat dairy, one or more servings daily, they had a 49% higher risk of dying of their cancer compared to the women who consumed uh, less than a half a serving. So, so now that's not huge. Uh, just one serving a day, that's your cheese pizza, for example, or a grilled cheese sandwich or mac and cheese or something like that. If it was the high-fat dairy products, it was, uh, there was a much higher risk of dying of the cancer. And the researchers speculated that it's the estrogens. Now, it, it's hard to know because, uh, as I said, milk is a cocktail and, and all the things coming from it are, are mixtures. But what they were suggesting was that 
the estrogens that are in milk and tend to be concentrated in the fattier products and maybe that's what's uh, what's driving it. Wow. Okay, fiber. Last but not least, you yeah. mentioned that fiber escorts unwanted hormones from your body. How does this fiber latch on to the hormones? Yeah, your, your liver is filtering your blood and what it does is it removes from the blood things that it thinks shouldn't be there. And so your liver says, hey, there's too much estrogen circulating, I'll take it out. And the liver sends it down the bile duct into the intestinal tract. And if there's plenty of fiber in your intestinal tract, it seems to escort that estrogen out, I mean, right down the toilet. So again, from the liver down through the bile duct into the intestine, down to the toilet, uh, fiber carries that estrogen away. And so where it becomes a problem is a person who had a salmon filet for lunch or chicken breast or spam or any, any animal product. Animals don't have fiber. And so you're having less and less fiber and the estrogen will still end up in the digestive tract, but without fiber there, the estrogen is reabsorbed back into the bloodstream in a process called enterohepatic circulation. The thing to remember here is have plenty of fiber in your diet, that's beans, vegetables, fruits, whole grains, that will carry that estrogen away and will leave you with the amount that nature wanted you to have so that your symptomatology hopefully will be less. Hopefully, right? Yeah. Well, share with us the results of the Harvard's Nurses Health Study. Well, this was a study looking at fiber. And what they did is they looked at how much fiber women were consuming, a Lar very large group of, of nurses, and those who got about 30 grams of fiber per day had about a 32% reduction in their likelihood of developing breast cancer. Now, 30 grams of fiber is not enormous, but it's, by American standards, it's a lot. Um, your average American is now getting 15, 16, 17, something like that. Once a person's on a plant-based diet, they can easily get to 30, 40. They can sometimes get to 50. And the more fiber in your diet, the overall, within reason, the healthier you're going to be. Wow. Yeah. Got to get that fiber in. Well, yeah, yeah, yes, but, but we don't have to do it with suffering. Uh, we can do it with food. So in other words, the reason I put it that way is some people think, I've got to go to the store and I've got to get a fiber supplement and I've got to take these yeah. fiber pills and whatever. Wait, 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 wait. Brand muffins, um, yeah. It, it, in the food naturally, it's the whole legume group, lentils, peas, beans, those are the fiber champions, followed by vegetables, followed by fruits, followed by whole grains. So that's where it is. Yeah, you, 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 hopefully you won't need a fiber supplement. And animals, no fiber, right? Zero? They, they are not plants. They don't have plant roughage. That's right. <laughs> That's right. exactly right. Well, what are free radicals and what can we do about them? Yeah, free radicals are sort of maladjusted molecules that end up in your bloodstream. Um, it's, 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 <laughs> maladjusted, really? They are. They are. <laughs> Um, in the course of normal body chemistry, it, in the same way as a factory produces factory waste, your body is a little, has factories in it too, so to speak. Each cell is, is producing things and it also produces waste. And some of these are, are free radicals. What they actually are is you breathe in oxygen. Oxygen goes into the cells of your body. And as the oxygen is consumed, some of the electrons that are circulating around that oxygen molecule get in unstable orbits or it may, it may be... Uh, you might lose an electron or whatever. These are now uh, uh, free radicals, and they can take a chunk out of your skin, leading to wrinkles. They can take chunks out of your DNA, leading to cancer, and uh, they are indeed maladjusted and, and need to be addressed. And they can. Well, okay, that wow. would be my next question. <laughs> okay. What can we what do, do, do about these free radicals? You answered it. You. I don't know. You must be in my head or something. Well, that, well that's, where, that's where antioxidants come in. Antioxidants will neutralize the free radicals and settle them down. So, for example, vitamin C is an antioxidant that patrols the watery areas of your body, the bloodstream, and so forth. Beta carotene, vitamin E, those are antioxidants that, that sit on the surface of the cell, and they wait for an, uh, a free radical to arrive, and they neutralize it there. And you don't have to go to the store and buy a bottle of vitamin C or beta carotene. That was my next huh? question. Oh, You're I'm sorry. Ahead of me. Oh, no, sorry. No, no, no. Okay, You're well, ahead of the game. Okay, well, just real quick. Vitamin C is abundant 
in plant foods, uh, fruits particularly, but also many vegetables have vitamin C. Meat has zero vitamin C. So this is another reason to go to the high fiber plant-based foods. Beta carotene, carrots, and all the other orange foods like sweet potatoes and so forth. Vitamin E is in, uh, in fattier plant foods, uh, seeds and nuts have it. And there's lots of other antioxidants too, and they tend to concentrate in plant foods. So the more you've got plants Berries. in your diet, Oh, yeah. Like crack. <laughs> exactly. Well, yeah, the, the whole berry range is, is, is very, very good, very, very helpful. Eat for color, you'll get your antioxidants. All righty. Yeah. Well, what about cru cruciferous vegetables? How do they help and deal with cancer? Okay, well, cruciferous vegetables, that's broccoli, cauliflower, kale, collards, uh, Brussels sprouts. They get this name cruciferous because they have a little flower that's sort of cross-shaped, and so people call them cruciferous. They help your body to eliminate unwanted chemicals, and it's back to the liver. The liver finds chemicals that, it, that shouldn't be there, and some of them it will just detoxify on the spot. And the way they act is you have certain enzymes in your body that act just like a policeman. They'll slap uh, handcuffs on the wrist of this bad chemical, and then, yes, they do. Uh, that's called a phase one enzyme. It grabs the chemical and, and, and attaches it then to a phase two enzyme, comes along and attaches that bad chemical to a big burly policeman like glutathione um, and carries it away. So to do that part, you need a phase two enzyme. The phase two enzyme connects it to the big burly policeman, the glutathione. And if, if I'm not taking this um, analogy too far, the, the point here is this. If you have more broccoli in your diet, or more Brussels sprouts, or cauliflower, or kale, or any of those cruciferous vegetables, you have more phase two enzymes. And if you have more phase two enzymes, you can carry these chemicals away. Some of those chemicals were going to be carcinogens. And if they are gone from your body, then the broccoli has uh, saved your life. So the more of these that you consume, the better off you're gonna be. Is it better raw, or like steamed or cooked, or both? You could do it either way. You're going to have an easier time digesting it if you cook it, but there are people who will take kale and just do a smoothie with, with uh, raw kale. So kind of any way you get it in there is good, but I have favored cooking the cruciferous vegetables for digestibility. All righty. Well, I heard that soy products should be avoided because they cause cancer. W what are your thoughts? Uh, and, and many, many people have heard that. Turns out to be a complete myth, unfortunately, or, or fortunately, I might say. Yes. Good. No, so, yes, so it does not cause cancer. But here's, here's the, the science behind it. Back, I think it was 1931 or thereabouts, researchers found that soy, soybeans and other beans too have what are called isoflavones. And the chemical structure does look somewhat like estradiol or other estrogens. And in fact, they actually will attach to uh, estrogen receptors. So that led researchers to think, good heavens, uh, this could cause breast cancer. Except that when you look at the research studies, they don't. Women who consume the most soy milk, tofu, tempeh, uh, edamame, soy products have about a 30% reduction in their cancer risk compared to women who uh, tend to avoid soy. So let, let me say that again in case, in case anybody was unsure. The women consuming the most soy have about 30% less breast cancer compared to other women. Um, so researchers then looked at women who have, have had cancer in the past because sometimes oncologists will say, oh, you know, don't have soy, it's got estrogens in it. Um, it turns out that the women who, who ignore that advice and consume the most soy, have again, roughly a 30% uh, less likelihood of dying of their cancer. So really? yeah, the women who avoid soy do the worst. The women who avoid soy milk and so forth, and they've had a cancer diagnosis in the past, they are the women who avoid soy are the ones who are most likely to die of it. So the way we think about it is that soy products do have isoflavones, they do seem to interact with the receptor, but what they're doing is, first of all, you have more than one receptor. You have alpha receptors that, that estro, estrogens, your body's estrogens like estrone, will attach to. You have beta receptors that the soy seems to attach to. And to, to, to make this kind of simple analogy, you have the gas pedal in your car and you've got the brake in your car. Soy pushes on the brake. 
And so you don't have to have soy, it's totally optional, but I think of it as, as very helpful. It does seem to reduce cancer risk uh, to quite a substantial degree. I have found I make soy yogurt now, and that mm. is just, it's, it's to me a godsend because it's so easy in the Instant Pot. Literally, you take the soy milk, put the probiotic in it, blend it, pour it into jars, put it into the Instant Pot, press the yogurt button, done. Wow. It's that simple. That simple. Amazing. And it is. I mean, and I use the probiotic acidophilus, and it's so easy, and it comes out. I mean, I, I make 64 ounces of the soy, you know, only soy mm. milk, and you want to make sure it's organic and GMO-free. Right. But I make that, 64 ounces, and you can start using that for the base of, like, dips and things like that, so you can dip your cruciferous vegetables into it. Aha. Uh -huh. uh -huh. And I bet you can you flavor know? it up any way you want, blueberries oh and strawberries and whatever. It does. I mean, I, I have a little dish of it in the morning, you know, with, with my berries, my crack. Yes. And then I'll sprinkle <laughs> on some oatmeal. Right. Just raw oatmeal, you know, just the old-fashioned oatmeal. I'll sprinkle it on top. And it, give it gives it almost like a chewiness to it yeah. as you're eating the berries and the soy. Oh, so that sounds wonderful. It's a delicious way to get that soy in. And super easy. And especially because, you know, if you're going, if you're trying, it's hard to find soy yogurt in, in a lot of stores. But it's super easy to make. The ones that you do buy from the store, they tend to have sugars added right. and other chemicals for stabilizers. Here, you're just taking, I take the West soy, and you're completely just 100% soy and water. Soy well, that's soy. great. That is, yeah. So, that's great. Good way. To I'm going to try that. Soy in. Yeah, oh my God, super easy. Ridiculously mm -hmm. easy. So... What about alcohol? Does this, is this going to increase risk for cancer? I mean, is there a safe level? I hate to sound like a party pooper, but alcohol definitely does increase breast cancer risk. And, and let me give you the numbers. For a premenopausal woman, it, it, let's say she has just one drink, but it's, but it's every day. And it's kind of her way of relaxing after work or whatever. Each drink that she has increases her breast cancer risk about 7% on, on average. You know, different women are different, but that's an average. After menopause, it gets worse, about 13%. That's one drink. So let's say... One drink? Right. If it's, if it's part of her daily routine. So let's, let's say she, she and her partner um, every day open a bottle of wine and they have it with dinner. And she has two glasses. That's 13 times two. We're now up to 26. So it's a substantial increase. And it's dose-related. So, yeah, it's a problem. Interestingly enough, I have to say, though, researchers have looked at this and they found that it may work. Alcohol may cause cancer by disrupting a B vitamin called folate. Folate is the sort of a DNA repairman. So that has led to the hypothesis, which may have something to it, that green vegetables, and, which supply folate, and foliage, green vegetables, foliage, folate, the, the folate along with alcohol might actually counteract some of that added risk. I, too early to say, I, this does not mean for sure that a woman drinking as long as she has green vegetables is not gonna get cancer. What we do know for sure, what we do know for sure is that alcohol increases risk and, and the f high folate plant foods, which are the green leafy vegetables in particular, do seem to reduce it a bit. Wow. Yeah. Well, what about sugar? I, I've heard that this feeds cancer. Popular notion, but there, there's not a lot behind it, except women with, with diabetes do have more cancer, more breast cancer. And so the thought was, all right, if you have diabetes, you're going to tend to run a higher blood sugar. Maybe the sugar is causing this to happen. That's possible. Equally plausible, maybe more so, is that the same diet and also weight gain that tend to cause the diabetes also will tend to cause breast cancer. So in other words, they may just be two coexisting conditions. The good news is that the same diet is going to affect both in a beneficial way. A healthy, low-fat, plant-based diet is, is the diet of choice for reversing or improving diabetes and ditto for breast cancer. Okay. Well, how about the pill? I mean, yeah. does this cause cancer? Yeah. The increased cancer risk with the pill is, is real, but small. 
So some women will say, well, the risk of pregnancy and so forth makes that worthwhile. That's, that's a woman's choice. But, but the short answer is yes, it, it does. But the, but the effect is really quite small. Well, thank goodness for that. Yeah. But how about IUDs? What, what are some of the issues going on here? Well, IUDs, um, there's, there's a whole a lot of them. And many of them don't have hormones in them. So that's not really an issue. However, some of the quite popular ones have copper in them. And that makes them effective. They work. It, it, it interferes with, with sperm. However, what's got me and some other people concerned is that copper is associated with Alzheimer's disease. We have looked at copper levels in the blood, and if you've got more circulating cop copper, your risk of Alzheimer's is higher, and there are a lot of reasons why that would be the case. So what about a copper-containing IUD? Does it release copper into the blood? Yes, it does. Tiny, 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 tiny amounts. Does but that it's bioaccumulative. I honestly don't know the answer to that. And I have been digging into this literature, and I, I, I wish that I could say that, that the copper-containing IUDs would not lead to copper accumulation and would not lead to higher risk of Alzheimer's. I hope that's the case, but I don't think we have enough data to know. But, I mean, aren't they very oxidative within the bloodstream? Yeah. The copper uh, itself? I mean, don't you kind of make this like fat, almost like an oyster does, you know, to protect itself from that sand grain? Don't you kind of make this fat pocket around the copper? Copper, like iron, is an oxidative, it's, it's what we call a transition metal, which is why you have a nice shiny copper penny and you look at the same penny a decade later and it's all dark. It's been oxidizing and it doesn't do it just in a penny, it does it in your bloodstream. And as that's happening, free radicals form as copper oxidizes. Same thing with too much iron. So the bad news is that we're concerned about copper. By the way, this also goes for copper pipes and copper cookware. So I, I don't, I suggest that people avoid having copper directly in touch with the food. And same with pipes. Don't drink water that's been sitting in your copper pipes all night long. So whether... The, the good news here, though, is if this is true, and if I can then make a decision to avoid copper and avoid excess iron and so forth, and if by doing that I can cut my risk of Alzheimer's, then that is a darn good thing because a few years ago we didn't have anything that, that we could do with this. But this is one of uh, many things, as you and I have discussed in the past, that we think we can control in our lives that might reduce the risk of Alzheimer's. So wow. that's, a good, that's a good thing. Wow. Endometrial cancer is more likely in women who have taken estrogens to control right. like menopausal symptoms. What's going on here? Well, as we, as we talked about, estrogen is a rather sneaky hormone. You know, you know it's, it's different from insulin. In, insulin is a hormone too. Insulin is made in the pancreas and it goes to the cell to escort sugar inside. But insulin is huge. It's the Goodyear blimp of hormones. It parks on the surface of a cell and it's going to escort sugar inside. Estrogen is not like that. Estrogen is tiny. Estrogen can arrive at the surface of the cell and it can go right inside. So uh, let's say a woman has extra estrogen, too much estrogen in her blood, either because she's taking estrogens or she's got extra body weight, body fat builds estrogens. That's more and more and more of it that can sneak inside cells, damage DNA and lead to cancer. We talked about that for the breast, but it can also happen for the uterus. So you need a, a, a little bit of estrogen is normal, but we want to keep it in balance. And the way we do that is with a low-fat, high-fiber, plant-based diet. Well, Dr. Daniel Kramer examined ovarian cancer incidences in 27 countries. What did he find? Yes. What Dr. Kramer looked at was really a, a couple of things. And, and by the way, he was focusing on dairy. But what he was focusing on particular, in particular was the dairy sugar. The dairy sugar is lactose. You know, it's a double sugar that when it breaks apart, it releases glucose and galactose. And it turns out that galactose is apparently toxic to the ovary. And so what Dr. Kramer did is he looked at loss of ovarian function and found that the more milk women drank, the higher the likelihood of infertility, but also the higher the risk of cancer of the ovary. And, and if you think about it, normally your ovaries would not be exposed to the breakdown products of lactose at all, except when you were a nursing baby. During this short window of time, you would have this exposure to cow's sugar, the, the lactose sugar, 
from cow's milk and never again in life. But because human beings are creative and we figured out how to make ice cream and all kinds of things out of cow's milk, now we're exposed to galactose, which we wouldn't have otherwise been. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, what about the researchers at Rutgers? They examined the diets of 490 women. With, That's right. I mean, focused on African-American women. Yeah, and which was, was a good thing to do because African-American women are at particularly high risk of breast cancer. And what they found was that those who consumed the most milk had substantially higher risk of cancer compared to those who tend to avoid it, roughly double. So, yes, uh, it's a good thing to not... Cons- it, you don't want to fool Mother Nature. Uh, Mother Nature said, get weaned already. Don't drink milk. You should drink your mother's milk, milk from your mom's breast. And after that, there's no reason to, to consume milk at all. And, and if, if one does, then one is exposed to things that never occurred in nature. And that's this galactose load hitting the ovary over and over and over again. Let me say a word about ovarian cancer, though, because with, with breast cancer, a woman has a chance of, of feeling it and being aware that it's there. With uterine cancer, sometimes uh, these things can be uh, detected earlier, too. Um, With ovarian cancer, the ovary is a little organ. It's in the middle of your abdomen. And if cancer forms there, often it's not detected for uh, for a long time. We remember Gilda Radner, the wonderful comedian from Saturday Night Live. And and she had such a a, a tragic story as as she died of ovarian cancer. We often think if the ovaries were, you know, on, on, on your arms, you know, somewhere where you could just feel them, you could diagnose this early. But it's, it, unfortunately, it's not diagnosed until it's too late in many cases. Just, this is a side question. If you did have, say, uterine cancer, you go through chemo, you go through radiation, you go through surgery, you go through that whole thing, you come out and you don't have cancer. Right. You've gone through it. If you don't change your diet, what are the chances of that cancer coming back? Two things can happen. One is the cancer can come back because we haven't necessarily gotten rid of it all. You can remove, say, the lump from a breast, but cells might have seeded elsewhere in the body. Secondly, women who have had one cancer, say breast cancer, are at higher risk for having a second cancer. So we want to eat as if we're at risk for cancer all the time. Um, in fact, although this is kind of a shocking thing to say, I think we should eat as if we have cancer now and imagine that there might be cells that are ready to create mischief in our bodies and eat as if we want to keep them at bay. So what are some of the dietary steps that we can take for tackling cancer? Yeah, well, there's lots of things. And we've talked about them already we talked about dairy products being a problem and, and meat products not having any fiber and having a lot of fat to drive up estrogens. So my step number one, get the animal products out of our diet. And I have to say, there has been so much momentum in that direction. Um, I, the, the Golden Globes, when, when, these awards, were, when the awards were, were recently uh, distributed, the Golden Globes said, okay, we're going to do a plant-based diet. For everybody. Now, they did it for environmental reasons, for justice reasons, and so forth. Animal rights reasons came up. But also, there's almost no better step for health than that. And the fact that it's becoming so popular now. Makes game it really, changers. Yeah, yeah, the game changers. That's for the athletes doing it, for the athletic edge. So it's getting easier and easier, and the payoff is huge. Okay, that's number one. Number two, I encourage people to keep fried foods and oily foods to a minimum. There are certain natural fats in beans and grains and vegetables are just tiny traces. That's what your body needs. Your body doesn't need to take that bottle of cooking oil and go glug, 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 all of your salad, all of your pasta. Third, eat for color. Wait, wait, Uh, wait. But what about my olive oil (laughs) that was cold pressed by virgins on the seventh solstice of the seventh (laughs) month? (laughs) Okay. An olive does have a trace of olive oil in it. And if you pop that olive in your mouth and chew it up, I think that's going to be just fine. However, you take 10,000 olives, throw away all the fiber, all the pulp, and you concentrate that oil, put it in a bottle. I don't care how beautiful and expensive that bottle is. I don't care if you call it extra virgin. It's really a refined product in kind of the same way as you, you extract sugar from sugar cane. People are very comfortable calling that a refined, unnatural product. Taking olive, you know, the, the olive tree does not have a faucet on it. You know, the, the that's an extract where you're removing all the rest of the plant. All the good stuff. 
<laughs> all, the, the part that's healthy for your body, yeah. And a couple things happen when you do this. Number one, the caloric content goes way, way up. You're not gonna gain weight eating olives, really. It's challenging to do it, but olive oil, <gasps> easy. Because you, you can pack in calories very, very quickly doing that. And conversely, if a person's trying to lose weight, if the oils are a big part of your diet, you're gonna have trouble. Let me give you well, one your more. Stomach, your stomach doesn't register the olive oil. Like I'd gone to the Italian restaurant and they come out with that dish of olive oil right. with the sauteed peppers and onions and garlic. Oh my God. And the bread is just a vehicle for scooping that, that oil up. And Yes. You, you can have had hundreds of calories before your, before your appetizers even arrive. So um, it doesn't even register within your stomach that you've just consumed four, five, six hundred, seven hundred calories. And it gets worse. All, all of that fat is absorbed within the first 40 centimeters of your intestinal tract, all of it. It's, it's not like someone's going to come out in the toilet later. Uh -uh. It, it's, it's going straight into your bloodstream and you are packing it into your body fat. So the fat I, you eat is the fat you wear. Where have I, I heard that before? I, hmm. I know we are cheering everyone up with this conversation, but that's, but that's the <laughs> truth. Um, let me give you one, one more, maybe a more enthusiastic one, more positive one. That's eating for color. You know, we think carrots, aren't they a nice color? Tomatoes, isn't that nice? Those colors are antioxidants. So the carrots, beta carotene, so the orange in sweet potatoes, carrots, other orange vegetables, beta carotene, good antioxidant. Uh, lycopene is the red color in a tomato. The purple color in blueberries or grapes, those are anthocyanins. All of these are antioxidants that protected the plant. And if you have large amounts of them in your diet, they will protect you too. No. So eating for, eating for color is a really good idea. All right. How about tofu? Uh, tofu, um, to well, the whole soy group. Some people love tofu. Some people like tempeh. Some people like soy milk. Figure out which one you like. And it, it, by the way, if you are a tofu phobic person and you're thinking, I, I just can't imagine, go to uh, a good Chinese restaurant, a good Sichuan or Hunan restaurant and, and have them make it for you in the right way. It, tofu is one of the more feared or sometimes mocked foods that as soon as people have it in the right way, they become addicted to it and they love it. Um, so, but it doesn't have to be that. It can be the miso soup or the tempeh or, or whatever. One of the things I like to do is I'll take some tempeh, T-E-M-P-E-H. You buy it at the store. I cut it up into little kind of wafers, saute it or um, marinate it in some uh, soy sauce, little low sodium soy sauce, and you could throw it on a, a dry pan and just cook it on both sides. You don't need any added oil or anything. And it's sort of, it's not bacon, but it's kind of that morning high protein crunch with no cholesterol and nothing to be embarrassed about. Nice. Yep. Oh, I have to works try really that. well. Yeah, it works really well. It's very, very fast. Okay. Well, is there anything else that we can do for to tackling cancer? Well, we already talked about fiber. Get a lot of fiber, but you're already doing that because we went plant-based, and so you're getting beans and vegetables and so forth. Lace up your sneakers. And here, let, let, let me push a little bit. I'm very keen on telling people to make small changes. That's good. But to tell you the truth, the more physically active you are, the better. So get your heart pumping a little bit. Exercise is good. It helps us in so many ways. It makes us feel better, but um, it also helps prevent cancer a little bit. We already talked about alcohol the less the better. Chemical exposures, read labels, go organic. If it costs a little extra, so what? Your, your, your body is worth it. And extra tip, if you bought organic soy products or organic soy yogurt, organic soy milk, by law, it cannot be GMO. It, can't, it cannot be a genetically modified organism. Right. Um, so uh, those are some good, good tips. Okay. Well, also, I want to st stick in about the chemicals that are in personal care products, because that's one of my biggest things. I mean, the Environmental Working Group, they've got the cosmetic database, certainly a great place to start to look at the personal care products and cleaning products, too. A absolutely. So, if you think about it, a, a century ago, we were not exposed to anywhere near the range of chemicals that, that we are now. And... Uh, Be better yeah. living through modern chemistry, <laughs> right? 1950s. That said, that said, it is not hopeless. And there are lots of things we can do in our own homes and our own communities to take care of ourselves. Now, 
no matter what we do, we are going to be exposed to certain things. We're going to inhale or ingest chemicals, and that's where your cruciferous vegetables come in because they recognize those chemicals and they escort them out of your body. All right. Well, how about supplements? Should we be supplementing anything? I think so, actually. I don't think you need a lot, but there's one I want to cheerlead for, and that's vitamin B12. You need B12 for healthy nerves and healthy blood. And it is not made by either animals or plants. B12 is made actually by bacteria. And some people, oh, and the reason you need it is if you don't have B12 in your diet, your blood cells are not going to divide normally and you could end up anemic. Um, and your nerve cells and brain are not are going to misfire. Not right away. It takes time to become deficient, but it can happen. So I recommend supplementing B12. And, and frankly, I recommend supplementing. I think everybody should supplement, but on a vegan diet, definitely. Absolutely. Well, there's two types of supplements. There's methylcobalamin and cyanocobalamin. I've heard both going both ways, but what's your thoughts? My thought is I don't know. I really don't know. If you asked a jury of scientists, the more of them would probably nowadays go for methylcobalamin, I'm guessing but whether it really makes a difference. So far as I have seen, both are effective. Both will prevent anemia and they'll prevent the, the, the nerve uh, changes, whether one or another yeah, but, is- I mean, cyanocobalamin, isn't that like in the cyanide I, family? I, right, exactly. And so, th so that's the argument for, for the methylcobalamin. One other thing, let me mention, uh, up until not too long ago, I used to say it really doesn't matter how much you take because the, the amount you need is so tiny. It's 2.4 micrograms. And so you go to the store and there's no pill that small. No. Uh, they're, they're 50 or 100 or 500 or 10,000. Oh, no, no, no. I've only seen 500. I've not right. seen anything less. Okay. And, and there are many that are much, much higher. There is some evidence now suggesting that it's better to be on the lower end of that. So, so that we do want to take it, but you don't need a huge boatload unless your doctor has prescribed it because you've been deficient. In that case, follow you know, your caregiver's advice. However, uh, my general recommendation is get the lowest one you can, take it every day or every other day, and that should be about it. Okay. So let's move on to reversing polycystic ovary syndrome. Tell us about Allison. Oh my God, her story was so powerful in the book. Would you share it with us? Yes. And by the way, for people who aren't sure what we're talking about, my new book, Your Body in Balance, it has... Every chapter has stories of, of real people in it. These are not made up people. These are real people. And Allison is a real person. She lives in Wisconsin. Allison is a registered dietitian. She's an oncology dietitian. So she helps women and men who have had a cancer diagnosis, and she helps work with them on, the, on their diet. But Allison had some problems too. She, well, for, first of all, she and her husband were having trouble getting pregnant. And she noticed a few things. She had a couple of uh, facial hairs, not much, but, but she didn't want it. A little touch of acne, a few, few things like that. And her doctor said, I think I know what this is. And what it was, was polycystic ovary syndrome. Polycystic ovary syndrome sounds like you're gonna have cysts on your ovaries, and for some women that's true. But it often can interfere with with fertility. And that was her issue. She was not ovulating on any sort of normal schedule. She could go months without a period and then what she would have would be very, very heavy. And, and conceiving was just out of the question. Well, Allison's a very bright person. And she said, wait a minute, I'm spending all this time helping other people reform their diets. Would a diet change help with the condition that I have? And so she changed her diet. Uh, more and more plants coming in and finally just said, all right, we're going to do this full, full bore. Vegan diet, all plants all the time and, and, and really healthy choices. Three weeks to the day within, uh, from, from her diet change. She ovulates three weeks after that. She is pregnant. Three weeks. Yeah, exactly. And so anyway, we have talked about this before that, that, the foods that we were eating can cause our hormones to go all squiffy. And, and that, that's female hormones and male hormones, all kinds of other things. And if we get back to the diet that Mother Nature thought we were going to eat, which is lots of vegetables and fruits and not a steak and not a chicken breast and so forth, 
And if we get back to that, the body can get back into better balance. So anyway, Allison has a beautiful baby now. And she's a very, very happy mom. And in fact, she sent me some pictures of, of she and her husband with, with their baby. And you have, you have never seen a more beautiful family in your life. Wow. That is, it's amazing. So what, tell us what is polycystic ovary syndrome? Yeah, well, polycystic ovary syndrome is, frankly, it's a complete misnomer. It's what, what it is, is a, a, a genetic disease. Um, in other words, your, your risk for the symptoms are, is partly genetically determined, but it's also partly environment because particularly the environment of our plate, the foods that we eat can, can make it worse or make it better. And the hallmark of it is really a little bit too much androgen, uh, male sex hormones. As you know, men have male sex hormones and female sex hor hormones, and, and women do too. They have a little bit of male hormone, a little bit of, and more female hormone. But in, in PCOS, the male hormone is just turned up just a notch. And so that will lead to the facial hair. It can lead to skin changes. Sometimes a little bit of hair thinning will happen and periods are all irregular as Allison had. And then for some women, but not all, they get these cysts on their ovaries. And so that's where the name came from, is polycystic ovary syndrome. But because it's a misnomer, you can actually have PCOS even if you only have the excess of androgen causing the other changes. So you don't actually have to have the, the uh, you, know, you don't actually have to have the cysts on your ovaries, but many women do. So what are the symptoms or problems with this? Okay, well, we talked about them a little bit. Allison's uh, was not having every 28 days having a new period. She would go for months without it. So, so that's number one. Secondly is, is that the skin will change. By, by that, I mean a little bit of acne and then the unwanted facial hair. These, these are the skin changes. And then number three, not really a symptom because your doctor is going to have to find it, but those are the cysts on the, on the ovaries that, that can occur. But along with it come all kinds of problems that you have you weight gain, insulin, sens uh, insulin sensitivity is impaired, so women be often become insulin resistant. Which that would then go to diabetes. Diabetes, yeah, exactly. It goes to diabetes. And in fact, doctors will then treat it with, with diabetes medications. You can also see all kinds of other things. As time goes on, you see more depression. You can see, we already talked about infertility. You can talk about um, heart problems. You see higher risk of certain, end, uh, certain cancers, particularly uterine cancer, the endometrial cancer. So all of these seem to go along with it. Well, do all women get the same symptoms? In front no, of? no, no, they don't. Um, and that's what was, was very puzzling and, and can be puzzling for a woman who might have this as well and, and puzzling for her doctor too. Hmm. Um, so the, the symptoms can vary, but, but it is those clusters. So you will see this, the irregular, irregularity in your cycle. You will see the skin, skin and hair changes and you will see, in, at least in some women, the cysts. Well, you mentioned that the condition was genetic. Is there yeah. any environmental impact on this, or is it a combination of both? It's really a combination. The, the tendency toward it is genetic. You'll see it, run in, it can run in families. In fact, Allison had a, uh, family members that had this. And so when she was diagnosed, she said, I wasn't really surprised. I kind of thought maybe that was, that was the issue. So yeah, it will run in families. However, um, Allison's genes did not change. She's now got a baby girl. She's fine. She's in good, good shape. She's still got the same genes. And so there are so many health conditions that are genetic. Diabetes is the classic one. There are genes for type 2 diabetes, but you change your diet. And diabetes can get worse or it can get better, depending on, how, on the, the diet changes that you've made. So we think PCOS is like that. It may not be completely gone, but it can become dramatically more man man manageable with diet changes. Well, how does a traditional doctor typically deal with, with this? Well, number one, I mean, they'll say you should, you should lose weight. They can give anti-androgen medications. And because I mentioned insulin sensitivity is impaired, they'll often give a drug called metformin, which people listening to this will go, isn't that the diabetes drug? And that's exactly what it is. It's, it's a drug that increases insulin sensitivity. And so, so that's a classic approach to it. And, and, and by the way, I, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that, that that approach should not be used. But what I am saying is that you're going to have breakfast. 
and lunch and dinner and let's pick those so that they work with your body chemistry as well and you may not need medications or the medication side effects. Well, are there side effects to these drugs? Yeah, there, there are. I mean, many people don't tolerate metformin very well. It's the classic side effects are digestive, which for most people are pretty mild, but, but, and for most people, the drug is safe, but there are a number of people who just can't tolerate it. Well, how would you treat this? Okay. Well, number one is we want to be on a diet that helps keep our weight down. And so that's a diet that, that, that uh, is loaded with vegetables and fruits and whole grains and beans because they don't have a lot of that grease in them that packs in the calories. And they have plenty of fiber to fill you up without so many calories. Mm -hmm. So weight loss is, is really step one. Step two, we've talked about controlling hormones, getting hormones back into balance. And low fat, high fiber is going to do that for us again. Step three, we want to help deal with our blood sugar. But the non-metformin approach is, again, a plant-based diet. And this goes to, to uh, our approach to diabetes that we've talked about in the past, where insulin resistance comes from fat building up inside the muscle and liver cells. And they're, they're no longer handling insulin very well. So the answer to, to making our blood sugar under better control is to get the fat out of the diet. That surprises people, but it works really, really, really well. Plant-based diet, don't add fat to it, and blood sugar control is improved dramatically. Wow, wow. Yep. So what about, going, coming back to the soy products again, because I, I keep hearing a lot of misinformation about soy. You know, the Canadian researchers, tell us what they found. Canadian researchers looked at soy, and they found that there are natural compounds in soy that actually help the body to, ha to handle sugar more healthfully. So if a woman has PCOS, that if she has more soy in her diet, what we believe is that this is going to allow her to have better insulin sensitivity, a reduction in insulin resistance. Researchers often will do this with uh, soy products, soy isoflavones. You can do it with your own soy milk, your own so, uh, tofu, or just natural foods. Yes, but not the ones that are like the isolated soy. No, I, I'm talking about sort of minimally, minimally processed foods. You know, right. One of the things about soy is it's a, a very flexible thing. You can turn it into anything. And I, I'm not suggesting that. I'm, uh, if you take edamame, that's a soybean. Right. Tempeh, that's soybeans that have been fermented. Uh, th there's not a whole lot of change that's gone on. All right. Well, how about cutting carbs? I thought this would be a good way to bring down blood sugar, right? Well, that's sort of the 1950s way of doing it. And it comes from this, this idea, it's understandable. A person says, I've got high blood sugar, so I should stop eating sugar. And carbohydrate does digest to release sugar. So if I just avoid that, then my blood sugar will fall, and it's, it will. But first of all, that, that doesn't get to the cause of it. The reason your blood sugar is high is that fat has built up inside the muscle cells and inside the liver cells so that insulin can no longer get sugar inside. When we stop eating all that extra fat, it comes out of the cells and your insulin can work again. And the proof of this is if you look at, in Japan, say back when the diet was very high in rice, before westernization, there was very, very little diabetes in Japan, it, despite the fact that they had a very high carbohydrate intake. So restricting carbohydrate is not the answer. In fact, what we find in our studies is the people who do the best are the people who don't restrict carbohydrate. Have it be healthy carbohydrate, beans and starchy vegetables and fruits and so forth, but don't limit it. The people who do the worst are the people who are carbohydrate phobic and they're afraid to have an apple or a banana or a pear. They're afraid, they're afraid of having these foods. And, and I have to say they just don't do well over the long run. By that I mean uh, their, their weight control is erratic and, and their diabetes control is erratic. It's much better to embrace the healthy carbs. All right. Well, some women, even with a diagnosis of PCOS, some women do manage to get pregnant. Are there additional risks associated with this pregnancy? There can be. We, we've talked about the relationship with diabetes. And so during pregnancy, that's a time when a woman is set up for gestational diabetes. It's more likely to occur. 
So what does that mean? That means we want to be on our healthy blood sugar controlling diet before pregnancy. And if a person hasn't started that diet before pregnancy, then it's a good idea to begin it during pregnancy. But the, the sooner you follow that kind of diet, the better. There's also a, a higher risk of high blood pressure during pregnancy as well. Not super common, but the same diet changes are the ones we'd recommend. Awesome. I don't know if I told you or not, but Dr. Deborah Shapiro and I are starting a program called the Pregnancy Advantage to help women who are getting, want to get their bodies pregnant ready to switch to a whole food plant-based diet and to get rid of the toxins out of it before they consider getting pregnant or if they're having trouble getting pregnant to help them as well. So. That is the greatest thing ever, I have to say. And when I, when I was writing the fertility chapter of Your Body in Balance, it was just striking to see one story after another after another of people who have had trouble and they recognize that they weren't on a particularly healthy diet regimen. They get onto this a healthy plant-based diet, their hormones get back into balance, and suddenly, instead of your fertility being bounced around like, uh, like, like a pinball in a pinball machine, suddenly your, your fertility is under your control in a right. better way. So that's a, that's a wonderful thing. Yeah. Okay, we're going from fertility, we're going to the other end of the spectrum <laughs> okay. now. Let's go to yes. menopause so, right. and tackle that. So let's start with the basics. What, what is menopause? Well, menopause is not a disease. It's not a diagnosis. And menopause is a normal... I don't know. It feels like it. Just saying. <laughs> Depend, depends on the situation. In menopause, the, the, ovary, the ovary has only so many... The ovaries have only so many oocytes or eggs. And they're running low on those. And when that happens, the normal hormone production stops. And then you're in what I think of as really withdrawal, that we then have hot flashes and all kinds of other, other symptoms that can occur. But the reason I say it's not a disease is there, are, there, are, there have been a number of people who have treated it as, as a diagnosis, and then they have to replace the hormones. That just pill. seems crazy, even like to a lay person like me. I, I... Yeah, well, it's, it's risky to do. A lot of problems come with it. And, and, and also, uh, there have been some people who have said, no, no, no. N the normal human lifespan uh, centuries ago was maybe 40 or 50. And so you're not supposed to be alive anymore. You're past your cell by date. And so all these menopausal <laughs> symptoms are just that, you, that you're now officially old. You shouldn't be here. And let me just say this. That is complete hooey. There is nothing to that whatsoever. There have always been people who have lived to be 80, 90 years of, years of age. Fertility is a risky thing, to, to put it this way. During a woman's reproductive years, she's getting surges of hormones every single month, oh. and hormones are risky. So what, na what nature wants to do is have menarche, the start of periods be a little bit later, menopause arrive, and during that reproductive window, we are gonna, we're going to have these estrogen waves, but nature says, okay, at age 50, this is not an age where you need a toddler on your kitchen floor. We no, are, <laughs> the no. Fact, the, the factory's closed. That's it. So the, Pink the, slips have been given out. <laughs> so, so you have a lot of other things to do in life, and now is the time to get on with those things. And the, re, the whole reproductive ballet was, is a certain part of life. So menopause is, is a normal thing. And the only issues about it is, is that it can be uncomfortable you know, in a lot of ways. And so, so that's why we wanted to devote a, a chapter to it. Well, I, I also, just on a side note, whales also live long after right. they go through menopause. So yes. I'm just wondering biologically if there was that advantage to, you know, because I read an article about the, way, the, you know, the grandmother whales helping the younger generation. You do see this actually in many species where... I mean, well, if it's just think of it in the human species. Is having, if you're a mom, is having nobody around, is that the best way to, to raise a family? Or is, is the survival of your progeny better if you have other people around you, your own parents, your, your partner, and, and others? Absolutely. So I'm going to suggest that there is a role for people after menopause. And, and, and by the way, not just in raising our family, but frankly, in government, in, in industry, and in all, you know, when, when a woman's reproductive time has, uh, is now fading into the past and she's doing other things, this is, for most women, it's the most productive time of their lives. 
Um, so anyway, it's, right. it's, 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 not, it's not for me to judge these things one way or another. But what I am saying is that menopause is not the end of life. Menopause is, is a page turning to a different, different type of life. And I have to be an example of that because right. honestly, I, once I got through menopause, it's like, uh, it's like a whole new world. It yep. truly is. Okay, medical anthropologist Margaret Locke of McGill University, she interviewed thousands of women between the ages of 45 and 55 living in the US and Canada. And she compared them with the women in Japan and the differences were striking. Share with yes. you your insights on this study. Well, the first thing was that Japanese women were not complaining about hot flashes. And the question was, well, are they, maybe they're just reticent. You know, they don't want to talk about these things. They're shy. Um, they don't yeah, complain. exactly. Exactly. That wasn't it. She looked in real detail and said, oh, come on, t tell me, you know, do, you have, do you have hot flash? And, and the answer was they did have some menopausal symptoms sometimes, but they were really quite mild. And hot flashes were uncommon. When they did occur, they were mild. And if they asked women, what are you feeling now? They said, oh, got a little backache, you know, or something like that. But it really, really, really wasn't much. And, and, and there was no Japanese word for hot flashes either. And so the question is, what's going on? And what we believe is that it was the Japanese diet. The Japanese diet, and, and again, this is back pre-Westernization. Yeah. The pre-Western diet was very rich in, in uh, carbohydrate, had a certain amount of protein, plant protein predominantly, so some meat, uh, some fish, but it was not a big thing. And it was not a fatty diet at all. And then at, Western, at Westernization, all these things changed. Fat came in, fiber went out. So um, now are they having hot flashes? They're having everything, yes. More hot flashes, a lot more complaints about this. And, and unfortunately, more breast cancer, more diabetes, all. Every, everything that relates to hormone haywire comes in when you change your diet. And, and in Japan, that's what it has been, very, very graphically. And luckily, that the message that we can take with us is that we can go the other way. If we have a westernized culture, let's say we raise our families on diets of grains and beans and vegetables and fruits and healthy foods, we can make all of these problems much less likely to occur. Awesome. I liked your comment in the book that menopause has become a diagnosis. Right. And with a diagnosis, as we know, the prescription pad gets written, out, you know, whipped out and writ, you know, something gets written for you. So hormone replacement therapy. Yeah, it is. started with a, well, it started really with pharmaceutical manufacturers who, who realized that people want solutions to these things and, and aided and abetted by doctors who wrote books like Forever Feminine, making outlandish promises that you have an anti-aging drug in, in pill form. And the, what rapidly became very, very popular was one called Premarin. Mm -hmm. um, marketed, marketed to this day by Wyeth Ayerst. Premarin is, uh, from a, comes from horses. It's, uh, it's, yeah. it's <laughs> I, well, I do have to tell really? you this. Yeah, I do, I do have to tell you this. Um, <laughs> horses are impregnated. The, a, a pregnant animal makes lots of estrogens. And the estrogens will go through the kidneys into the urine. And so they have a bag attached. They're, they're in a stall. And this bag is attached to collect the urine so it won't go into the ground, into the hay. And then the urine is sold. And it's, you, take the, you can extract the estrogens from the urine. And then they were trying to think of what would they call this. And they said, well, it's pregnant mare's urine. Let's call it Premarin. Uh, yes, pregnant mare's urine, Premarin. But aren't you getting horse hormones too? That's, that, that's, that's all you're getting, yes. That, that's what you're getting. And anyway... At first, it looked like it was fairly safe. And it looked like it wasn't increasing cancer risk and, and heart disease risk and so forth. But then researchers said, well, wait a minute. The women who are taking this are generally wealthier women, health conscious women, um, they're by, and so they're generally taking better care of themselves. I wonder if we do a randomized trial, what will happen? Um, does Premarin help? And the Women's Health Initiative uh, is a huge study that, among other things, did look at the effects of taking Premarin either alone or in combination. And suddenly, everything went crazy. Uh, the women taking the, the common hormone combination of the Premarin with the estrogens, and then they'll take a progestin along with it. 
they had more heart disease, they had more cancer, they had all kinds of, 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 of problems. And when the results came out, that instead of reducing cancer risk, it increases cancer risk, women far, far and wide would read this in the paper and a great many stopped taking it. And when that happened, breast cancer rates dropped dramatically. Now you would think, by the way, you think doctors would cheerlead for this and say, this is great. But by and large, the medical com community has been very slow to drop its prescribing pen. They have been continuing to, to recommend it, but they'll say, just take it for a short period of time, the smallest dose that, that manages your symptoms. I don't think that's the answer. Uh, because what we're often doing is just delaying the menopausal symptoms. So I, I really think that this idea of hormone replacement therapy has been a mistake. So what are some other choices besides hormone replacement therapy? Yeah, um, well, a few things. First of all, I should mention that the, the, the Premarin one is the animal-derived one. There are many, many other types of hormone replacement therapy that are not animal-derived. They typically start with a plant source and then it's, it may be modified in one way or another. They, they don't have the cruelty aspect of it. No. That, sa that said, if they are estrogens, they are going to increase cancer risk if you take them systemically. So what do you do? There are lots of, of symptoms of menopause for, for hot flashes. The one that's gotten probably the best science behind it is the use of soy. Not every woman benefits from it, but many women do. And it's probably dose related. It may be that the occasional glass of soy milk will not do very much, but in some women have tested soy powders where they're having a higher amount. And, and it does seem to have an anti hot flashes effect. They may not be totally gone, but they're muted for many women to a great degree. With regard to the, the sexual symptoms that can occur, I'm talking about vaginal dryness and, 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 and pain and, and so forth. Um, in, in this case, if a woman is using um, an estrogen preparation, my suggestion, it obviously it's between her and her caregiver, but my suggestion is rather than taking it orally, just use a local. There, there are local uh, applications that you can use. Uh, to some extent, it will still be absorbed systemically, but probably much less. And so far, cross our fingers, we haven't seen it being associated with breast cancer. Whether that'll change, we don't know but it's probably safer to use it locally than systemically. Well, what about bioidentical hormones? Many women are taking them, but the thing to remember is that your bioidentical just means it's identical to, your, to the hormones your body makes, as opposed to being identical to the ones that a horse's body makes. Okay. Uh, so far, so good, but keep in mind your own estrogens cause cancer. Mm. So right. if, if you have extra estrogen in your body, whether you got it right. from having more body fat or you swallowed it, it's going to cause cancer. So I, I do not think that bioidentical hormones are, are safe. I, I think they're not. Okay. How about some of the herbal treatments? I know like I used black cohosh, yeah. evening primrose. Yes, there, there have been a number of studies on them. I have to say I'm not, and they do seem to be safe, I have to say. I'm not particularly impressed by their symptomatic effic efficacy. You, every health food store sells them. You could buy them, you could try them and see if it helps you. The ones though that I've found to be most eff effective and have the best science is probably the use of the soy isoflavones. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, with menopause, you know, we see the drop in estrogen that's gonna translate to, you know, the vaginal lining becoming thinner, the vaginal canal becoming shorter and narrower. You know, and this is going to lead to changes, you know, dryness, itching, sometimes painful intercourse. So what can we do there, Neil? Um, this is where uh, lubricants can be helpful. Or if you're using an estrogen, just uh, a, the, the, a lower dose only used locally. And by the way, you don't use it immediately before intercourse. Use it at a different time. Could, could your partner could absorb some of your, your partner will absorb it, yeah. Yeah, you can. Ooh, yeah, and not you know, a good thing for... Yeah, a guy doesn't need to be absorbing estrogen. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So during menopause, you see these hormone shifts in the brain, and that can influence mood regulating, you know, neurotransmitters in our brain. I, 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 honest to God, I can, all I can say is my poor husband when I went through this. Oh, yeah. my God, bless him. What a good guy. Anyway, we're, we're talking like depression, perhaps memory problems. 
are these going to be like permanent changes that are, we're going through here? They're not. This is this is a phase. It con it, con it, it, it it comes and it goes. But it's worrisome because yeah. uh, ma many women will think my memory is just shot, and and they will say, "Is this the beginning of old age? Is it going to get worse?" And as you it's said, scary. Mood, it is scary, and your mood can change. Um, and sometimes oh. sometimes in ways that you just didn't think. You, you'll uh, a woman might find herself flirting, and she thinks, "What was I doing?" It's just our hormones are all they got a mind of their own, and the best thing is for, for, for her to know and for the people around her to know, because hopefully some of them have been there, that this is a phase of life. It's gonna come, it's gonna go, it's gonna pass. And sometimes it takes longer than you'd want, but, uh, but, it, but, but this, too, this too will pass. Can we wear like, should we like wear signs or something? So like, <laughs> so you know that if you're dealing with this person, cause wow, yeah. I mean, I just remember my hormones being all over the place and just shifting and one minute bursting into tears and just uncontrollable crying. I mean, just, you know, for no reason. Oh, oh yeah. my gosh. Uh, Craziness. Estrogens are steroid hormones. And when they're going through shifts, they cause all kinds of issues. And that's, that's all part of it. But on the other hand, let's make sure that we're following as healthy a lifestyle as we can. Let's, let's lace up our sneakers and get plenty of good exercise. Let's uh, follow a healthy plant-based diet that'll keep our weight down. Um, that's going to minimize the symptoms. You can use uh, some of these other preparations as we've talked about, and we're going to get through this. All right. Well, Dr. Barnard, thank you so much for taking the time to go through this again. Oh my gosh. And we have part three. We're going to switch to the men and we're going to be tackling the hormonal cancer for men. That's the prostate and testicular. And we're also going to be talking about curing erectile dysfunction and saving your life. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Jean. And I want to say, uh, I really appreciate how you get the word out there. And all of the things that we have talked about are things that are so important to people. And so many people have not heard what you and I have been talking about. So I'm hoping people will share uh, your program far and wide. If they pick up a copy of your Body and Balance, I hope they'll share that around with other people too. Please do, because it is so important. And everybody needs to get a copy of this book. I can't say enough about it. it, is, it I think it's one of your best. I really do. It's amazing. Well, thank you. It was fun to do. I got to say, I want to tip my hat to Lindsay Nixon, who did all the recipes. There are, I think, 65 of them, something like yeah. that, breakfast, lunches, and dinners. And, and it uh, beats the heck out of taking a pill. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a nice, nice thing to change your diet and, and regain your health that way. Well, thank you. And we'll see you soon. Thank you, Jane.